Steve Arnold and Jeff Notkin are modern day treasure hunters. These are for sure the real thing. Look at this. They travel the world in search of meteorites, alien invaders that have been crashing into our planet for the past four and a half billion years. On this adventure, a massive fireball blazes a trail across the dark sky over Wisconsin. There was an explosion, and the house shook and rattled. We thought we had been nuked. The guys drop everything and head for the Midwest to find freshly fallen, extremely valuable extraterrestrial gold. Yeah, baby! Something less than two days ago was up in space, and now the first one to it gets it. But Mother Nature reigns on their parade, and the hunt stalls as their brand new meteorite hunting machine breaks down. In the end, Jeff and Steve actually find themselves standing in their very own field of dreams. Look what's in my row! April 14th, 2010. Above southern Wisconsin, a giant fireball streaks across the sky. Overnight, rural Wisconsin is thrust into the global spotlight. This meteorite fall is the most famous meteorite fall in the history of the world. It's a big statement to make, but more people around the globe know about this fall than any other fall in the past. The incoming meteor is about three feet across and weighs close to one and a half tons. It blows apart nearly 18 miles above the Earth's surface with a force of 40,000 pounds of TNT. As it crashes to Earth, Jeff and Steve are getting ready for the Northeast Astronomy Forum in New York. When the guys receive confirmation that the fireball lands on the farmland around Livingston, Mifflin, and nearby Mineral Point, Wisconsin, the conference is in jeopardy. It's so much fun when you're there the first time a kid holds a meteorite. It just gets so exciting. Yeah, like, it's so whoa. heavy. Is it really from outer space? In the end, Jeff honors their New York commitment. I promised that we, we would be here, and um, it's, it's really important that we keep our word. Steve, on the other hand, has dropped all obligations to pursue the Wisconsin Fireball. He starts by contacting Doppler radar expert Rob Matson to begin to track exactly where the fireball may have hit the Earth. So um, when I get there, where do I need to hunt? You got some good Doppler on this? I do. We've got about uh, four different radars picking this up. I'm video conferencing with my friend Rob Matson, who's an expert in taking Doppler radar information and crunching the numbers. His information is telling me there's rocks on the ground uh, 15, maybe even 20 miles long. Looks like it just skirts over the north side of this little town called Livingston. Is it going northwest or is it heading southeast? It's uh, definitely heading uh, southeast. Okay. About 120 degrees. There's four different Doppler radars that uh, picked up the small, so it's looking like a pretty positive signal. Doppler radar can track the location of an object and the speed at which it's traveling. Based on this information, I'm gonna go get to the small end, see what I can find, maybe drive around on the road, see if there's anything just visible, you know, on the dirt roads or even the paved roads, then start going, you know, towards the medium and getting larger and larger and larger. When a meteorite comes into the atmosphere, oftentimes it breaks up into more than one piece, and those pieces will get scattered across the ground. That's what we call the strewn field. Typically, the smaller, more plentiful pieces fall first, creating the small end of the strewn field. The larger pieces fly farther because of their greater mass and inertia. Steve decides to begin his hunt in the small end of the strewn field to increase his odds of a fresh find. We know where we gotta go. A little bit of wind's gonna maybe move them a little bit, but we know where to start. I've gotta get up there, start finding these rocks. With that, Steve hits the road for an all-night drive to Wisconsin. As Steve approaches the strewn field, he begins to scour the land for signs of meteorites. This is what it's all about. It's almost like a fire alarm going off. 
there's just a thrill, uh, you know, of something that that less than two days ago was up in space, and now it's on the ground, and first one to it gets it. That's that's what it's all about right here. First of all, the more pristine a rock is, the more valuable it is. And there's a chance there could be thousands of pieces. And if there are, you want to be the first one in the celestial Easter egg hunt, essentially. This was a really bright fireball. I saw it from a long distance away. A uh, slow angle, it lasted for a long time. We know where the car was roughly, when it's a long ways away, um, you, can, you can triangulate, you can get a, a, a direction, a bearing on where the thing uh, started and where it ended. You, you get a couple of those from different directions and you can pinpoint the spot. Doppler radar gave us a real shortcut on that because people heard the sonic booms around here and uh, the images showed up on the radar real quick. So it gets you excited that, and, and it doesn't happen every day. And a lot of times a fireball will happen and it'll be over really wooded area or it'll be over a national park or it'll be over mountains or it'll be over water. And yeah, you know something probably landed, but you know your odds of finding anything are, are nil. And so we saw this, look, looked at the map and went, hey, it's farmland, which can be good, it can be bad. Something little can hide in the grass real easy, real easy. Uh, there's also the wind that plays a role in, in moving the pieces a little bit. So um, we, we factor that in a little bit. And uh, so here we are. For a meteorite hunter, there is nothing more sacred than a space rock that has been on Earth for just a couple of days. Such a find could have a value of up to $100 per gram. The scientific value could be unlimited. On March 22, 1998, two meteorites were recovered in Monahans, Texas. NASA scientists analyzed the space rocks within days of the fall, revealing the first ever samples of water from space. A thousand miles away from the Wisconsin Stroom Field, at the Astronomy Forum in New York, Jeff has his hands full fielding questions about the Wisconsin fireball go, and explaining the absence of his meteorite hunting partner. Oh, he goes on his own. He doesn't need my permission. He's a loose cannon. I hate to hold him back. You know, he's such a maniac. I've got to get out there. He jumped in the car and drove all night to get to the strewn field. Steve's out there now. He's supposed to be here with me. He's very naughty. It was mainly a big boom to begin with. When investigating a fireball and forming a hunt strategy, eyewitness accounts and permission to hunt private land are invaluable first steps. Because the Wisconsin fireball happened at around 10 p.m., a lot of people saw the night turn to day for a brief moment. And then it kept getting closer and closer and, and brighter and bright white, and then after it peaked in its its whiteness, it right. turned yellow and then orange and then just kind of burnt out. And did you hear any sonic booms? I did or not. Anything? I was okay. I called my wife, who live, we live in town here, and uh, I was, and the girls answered the phone and I said, What are you doing out of bed? It's after 10 o'clock. <laughs> well, Molly saw a big lightning and it's gonna storm. I said, That wasn't lightning. And then they started to scream. And Deb grabbed the phone and said, There was an explosion. That's usually the very end of it. The loud rumbling that racked nerves that night was the result of the meteor's speed as it entered the Earth's atmosphere. When an object reaches a speed faster than the sound it's making, it pushes through its own sound waves. The sudden equalization of air pressure forward and aft of the disturbance creates a sonic boom. Anytime you have a solid mass going faster than the speed of sound, you have a sonic boom created. When there are multiple pieces, as in a meteorite breaking up into a bunch of pieces, 
Sometimes you can have multiple sonic booms all on top of each other. It can be a very loud experience if you're close to where the fireball is. Steve gets his first big clue from a local farmer that hunters have already found pieces of the supersonic space rock. Neighbors were here this morning. They found two of them just west of us here. OK. Yeah. Oh, um, how far they, west? They, they say, well, less than a half mile. OK. And they say we were right in the path here. OK. Only two days after the fireball, news of other hunters in the area is bittersweet for Steve. Competition means he needs to speed up his reconnaissance and focus his hunt. The good news is the other hunter's finds offer him the perfect starting point. So this fireball came in uh, Wednesday night about 10 o'clock. The reports started hitting the internet uh, shortly afterwards. People saw this thing from, from six or seven states, and it came in really slow, lasted for um, six to seven seconds long, which is extremely long for a lot of fireballs. And there was multiple flashes, so there's a, there's a decent chance that shows that this could have broke up. And, and right where we're at right now, it's where it, this thing came over. Moments later, Steve spots something in the road. Excuse me a minute. I'm gonna see if there's something out here. Oh, ah, Jesus. White rock with black tar on the outside of it. It's his first meteor wrong of the trip. A small terrestrial stone covered with tar. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Back on the road, Steve heads to where the initial finds were reported. He hunts using one of his favorite tools of the trade. Time to break out the magnet stick. Magnets are a meteorite hunting staple. Steve's walking stick has a high strength rare earth magnet attached to it, which allows him to separate iron laden meteorites from the non metallic meteor wrongs. A thousand miles away in New York, Jeff's holding down the fort and still explaining his partner's absence. I'm sorry my evil twin isn't here. <laughs> that's probably, that's probably that's you are so right. <laughs> he is in Wisconsin in the strewn field right now. Jeff is exactly right. Steve's in the center of the strewn field perusing the intersection of two country roads where he's convinced the meteorite intersected with Earth. His friend and fellow meteorite hunter, Brad Wagner, arrives at the strewn field about a mile to the northwest with instant results. Hey, Brad, what's going on? You found one? Don't touch it. Oh, that dog. Freshly fallen meteorites command a premium if they're untouched by human hands. Look at that. Oh, it is. Look at that. Way to go! Oh, it's got a little bit of brown secondary crust. Wow, you got a baggie? Let's, yeah, let's not touch it. Ooh, it's got a broken face. Look at that. That's probably about 10 grams. Oh, there's gotta be more here. Brad's find is all the evidence Steve needs to continue hunting in the area. The light road also proves to be an ideal backdrop to spot the dark burned fusion crust of a freshly fallen meteorite. And it doesn't take long to find his first space rock. Brad, got one. Well, that's not as big as mine. No, it's not, but it's prettier. Look at that. Look at that guy. It's got a little broken face to it. We don't know if there's three of these out here or if there's 300 or 3,000. It just, time's gonna tell. Ha <laughs> ha. This is such a great place. Wow. Gotta look for more. Meanwhile, back in New York, Jeff finishes up his obligation and boards the next plane to Wisconsin. He picks up the team's custom-made American chopper and heads for Steve and the strewn field. But Jeff's ride goes dead. 
just as he pulls into the hotel parking lot. A mechanic is called, engine parts are tweaked, and there are multiple attempts to get the bike started the old-fashioned way. Soon, push comes to pull. But in the end, nothing works. The prognosis is bad, so Jeff and Steve call the equivalent of an automotive ambulance to get their meteorite-hunting bike the attention it needs. The loss of valuable hunting time causes tempers to flare. Here, well, let, let's, we, 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 we can straighten it. Oh, don't pull it down again. I'm way too tired for this. Well, we got to get it on straight, Jeff. I mean, I know your attitude's not good about it, but... Well, that kind of puts a damper on the day's operations. Yeah. That was going to be so perfect. We want to use the motorcycle as part of our hunting strategy, and it's a big blow to have it conk out just as I get into town and, and we're ready to go. But we'll have to figure out how to carry on one way or another. We'll go out and hunt on foot if we have to. With the bike in the shop, Jeff and Steve climb into a rental and head to the strewn field. There are three basic types of meteorites, stony, iron, and stony iron. Like most meteorites, the one in Wisconsin likely came from the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Their fall to Earth begins when they're knocked out of their orbit, either by other objects or by the pull of the sun's gravitational field. These space rocks are all that's left of the material that came together to form Earth and the planets. They're about the same age as our solar system, around four and a half billion years old. Steve and Jeff make their way to the center of the strewn field. The guys are convinced they will find larger rocks here if they can get access to search the private property of local landowners. They begin to make the rounds, Steve Arnold. Hi, Steve. meeting with property owners to access their land while gathering info about the fall to help them form a hunting strategy. Wanting to do some hunting today and then maybe even on Monday, didn't know if, it, if we could get your permission to do that. Yeah. All right, well, appreciate it. What are your plans for that piece of ground? I'll uh, put it in the corner here within a week. Within a week, okay, okay. Not the news Steve was hoping for. Farmers are out planting the crops for the coming season right now. And we spoke to a farmer and he said he had over a million dollars of potential income from his crop and there is no way he could delay. These small meteorites will be lost forever once the tractors have gone over this ground and turned the soil over. So it's, it's do or die. If we, don't, if we don't get them today or in the next couple of days, they're, they're gonna be gone for good. With a new sense of urgency, Jeff and Steve meet farmer Scott Moneypenny. Hey, sir, Jeff but he found a rock. How are you doing? Great pleasure. And he comes bearing gifts. <gasps> oh, wow. Where's the other bit? I Look at the brecciation on that. Brecciation happens in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. When two space rocks made of different materials collide, the force combines them into one single mass. A close look at the stone shows the different rock formations inside. But there's something else interesting about this particular meteorite. Isn't that just awesome? It looks a lot like Park Forest. Park Forest is the name given to a meteorite that crashed to Earth in the Chicago area seven years earlier. If the Wisconsin meteorite's connection to Park Forest can be verified, it would suggest that the two falls, separated by seven years and strewn fields hundreds of miles apart, could have originated from the same parent body. This phenomenal coincidence could increase the value of both meteorites. Congratulations, <laughs> you're a meteorite hunter. <laughs> He's graduated from meteorite hunter Sorry. and meteorite finder. <laughs> Where'd you find it? It was up to my place. How close to a building was it? Right next to it. Oh, wow. That looks like it, it whacked something and broke it. It really does. <laughs> yeah, there's absolutely no traces of secondary crust on that. The lack of a secondary fusion crust suggests this space rock broke apart after the fireball extinguished. That and its proximity to a nearby building means this space rock may have collided with a man-made object. 
This would make it extremely rare and even more valuable. And there are collectors who are fascinated by meteorites that have hit something. And they only collect, they're called hammer stones, if, it's, <laughs> if it hits something that's man-made. A five-pound hammer stone that hit a house near Chicago during the Park Forest Fall seven years ago sold for more than $50,000. Hammer stones aren't the only valuable items. The damaged piece of roof, windowsill, and closet door it hit sold for $2,700. A mailbox hit in Claxton, Georgia was auctioned for an astounding $82,750. And when a 27-pound meteorite punched a hole in the trunk of a Chevy Malibu in Peekskill, New York, its value skyrocketed. It's now worth nearly $100,000. So if we can find a dent or a little mark in the roof of your building, this is suddenly going to go up in value for you. <laughs> they head to location number three, the farm where the meteorite was found. They're looking for evidence of an impact to determine if it's truly a hammerstone. If it is, the value could skyrocket. Now, how did you know what to look for? We're we just reading the paper uh, or local I seen stories? One. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I kind of knew what it looked like. I Excellent. seen the black and picked it up, and I checked it with a magnet, so you could feel the See? Ball, so. <laughs> you know all the tricks. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so you found them just right down here, right by the side of the building. Amazing. You've got a good eye. People search their whole <laughs> lives and never find a meteorite. <laughs> could have hit the roof and bounced back. Even. Maybe. Maybe. So here are the, the two fragments that this gentleman Scott found on his property, broken, right next to a building. We think it's uh, likely or possible that it hit the building. Some interesting things to note, the fusion crust's very fresh, it's sort of blue-black. We're rather intrigued because it, it really does seem like this meteorite hit this building behind me and there, there could very well be some other pieces very nearby. It could be a, an authentic barn smasher. <laughs> One of only a couple known in the world. Here he found two fragments right next to each other. And they the fit other, together. Yeah, the other ones have got to be around here somewhere. Somewhere. I am inclined to think it hit the pavement. Despite their best efforts, the guys find no evidence that Farmer Scott's meteorite is a hammerstone. In their continued search for strewn field information, Jeff and Steve touch base with another local farmer named Keith, who also saw the fireball. So you were in the silver building here? Silver you were working? This building right here, I was working in there. And the flash was like a set off to that. It looked like it was right straight up there in the sky. That flash was first, and then just seconds, that's when the boom hit. And that illustrates perfectly how light travels more quickly than sound. You see the flash, and then the sound has to. He's got some advice for the guys based on what he saw that night and what he's learned about some of the meteorite finds. I'm sure, fellas, you're, you're just a little bit too far north right here. I'd say half mile to a mile too far north to, to find anything right on here. It lit the whole sky. That, that silo up there was like it was broad daylight. Like a big flashbulb. Just, just like a big flashbulb. Based on where Farmer Scott found his broken space rock, and with Keith's new information, the guys adjust the size of the strewn field. They now have even more farmland to cover. The fireball came in like this. And yes, this is farther to the south and west. So it does, it stretches the strewn field out a little. We need to see Keith's other property on the other side of the street. He said no one's been on that. OK. Let's do that now. But before the guys leave, another local man approaches them with space rocks he found with his son. Amazing! These are for sure the real thing. Look at this. Wow! What an unusual shape. This stone broke up in flight. This happens during uh, explosive fragmentation in flight. And then it started to melt again. And so this this kind of rough black covering is called secondary fusion crust. 
We're visiting with Wisconsin's youngest meteorite hunter. It was right next to the waterway. Fantastic. Inspired by local success stories, the guys are confident that somewhere in this idyllic farmland, there are a lot of big space rocks just waiting to be found. Day two in southern Wisconsin begins with a morale-boosting delivery, the newly repaired chopper. Jeff takes it for a quick test drive before picking up Steve. Then it's off to the strewn field armed with the new intel collected from the locals. The clustering of the nearby finds made by farmer Scott, Troy, and his dad has the guys convinced they have located the sweet spot of the nearly two by 12 mile strewn field. They begin at hunt location number four, a privately owned farm in the middle of the strewn field. They cover acre after acre on foot with magnet sticks in hand and a sense of humor in tow. Let's have a little natural music for a change out in the field. Kind of makes me hungry for frog legs. Yeah, I knew that was coming. Not that I think you're predictable or anything. No. I've got a hunch there's something else there. Better watch what I say. <laughs> the guys cover part of the 160-acre parcel but find nothing. Steve's hunch is wrong. And this area of the sweet spot proves not so sweet after all. They depart to greener pastures in location number five, farther downstream toward the large end of the strewn field. They split up and hunt land in an area that, according to their acquired intelligence, should be prime space rock real estate. This is probably about the best possible place to hunt. The fireball went right over my head, going that way. Jeff. Yeah. We got some clouds coming this direction. They're looking dark. But should we keep on hunting, and if it starts raining, we'll just run back to the truck? Well, a little rain doesn't hurt anyone. It's lightning bolts that I'm afraid of standing on a hilltop with a stick in my hand. Yeah, you should try holding the stick up above your head. Like this? Perfect. The Wisconsin meteorite is a stony meteorite, but it also contains about 20% iron, which will begin to corrode once contact is made with moisture. So despite the threat of lightning storms, the guys regroup and keep hunting. Hey, Steve? Yeah. Um, something just caught my eye, then I went back. I was going that way, I saw a black stone and I walked by it and I thought, nah, that isn't one. And then I thought, no, I've got to go back and just check it. But it's one of those things where you see a rock and you go, nah, nah, and then it starts annoying at you. And I go, no, I got to go back and check that. Dude, that? Is that what you saw? That, that could be it. <laughs> yes! Yeah, baby! Wow! Oh, that's beautifully orange. Check it out. Woo! That's fabulous. We're out here hunting, and there's a lot more meteor wrongs than there are meteorites. And Jeff calls me over. I don't know what he thinks he saw, but it's not like I'm finding anything over on my side of the field anyway. Four eyes are probably better than two. And uh, we score. Their second find is considerably larger than the three gram rock Steve found in the road. It weighs 42.2 grams and is worth about $4,000. This meteorite has an unusual cone shape. It's got a rounded leading edge and a flat trailing edge, and that means it's oriented. As it hurtled through the atmosphere, burning, the surface melted back and it acquired this shape. It also has a rich black fusion crust. The, the exterior ha has literally been fried as it burned in the atmosphere. And finally, it has a rollover lip, and that's created when some of the molten surface of the meteorite literally rolls back onto the reverse side. All of these characteristics are unique to meteorites, and it's got everything. Orientation, fusion crust, a rollover lip, it's a fresh fall, it just landed on the Earth. It's everything that a meteorite collector could want. With more storm clouds on the horizon, Jeff and Steve ride back to the hotel to trade their three-wheeler for the shelter and safety of something with four wheels. The race is on for the guys to find large and valuable space rocks before the rain and its corrosive effects come into play.
But in this case, the rain wins. That was a nice welcome. Yeah. Rain. It's been a while since I've been meteorite hunting in the rain. So we don't know if this stone is a ruster or not. I remember those stones that we picked up in, in Park Forest back in 2003. After the first rain, they started to oxidize noticeably. Yeah. So not only are we not doing any hunting, our meteorites might be rusty as we speak at this moment. With limited time remaining and only two small finds, the guys head directly to the large end of the strewn field, intent on bagging bigger, more valuable meteorites. In location number six, Steve has a new secret weapon, perfect for locating the valuable bounty. Well, Steve asked me to come up here to the top field so I could see his new metal detector, but he's not here. And that's our landowner coming this way in the big tractor. I suppose I'll ask him where Steve is. Hey! Is this your idea of work? Yeah! I thought you said you were hunting up here. I am! Oh, right. I am! This is my new metal detector. Really? Really. Check this out. So like, this $250,000 machine, you think it's picking up the ride. What it does, that right there is a metal detector. Little pieces of metal will freeze this. And this is one that got caught in there, and, and we found it, just a little nail, set it off. So any meteorites that landed in these rye fields that would have got cut and sweeped together, tossed up. The metal detector on this rye harvester is meant to protect both the machine and the cattle that feed on the grain from any metal objects that might be picked up. The grain is gathered by the spinning rakes and is fed toward the center metal detecting unit by two horizontal augers. When the detector encounters metal of any kind, the mechanism instantly shuts down and spits the grain and the metal objects back out for collection. It's the ideal hunting tool to cover this massive field the guys think could hold more $4,000 rocks. I was going to say that it seems like cheating, but I think actually Steve was being quite resourceful. Certainly a good way to cover a lot of ground. I just wonder if that metal detector would really pick up the iron in a stone meteorite, but I guess it would if it can pick up a nail. It's quite clever, really. I just think it's a bit unfair that he gets to ride in the tractor the whole time. I never get to ride in the tractor. Oh, well. I suppose I'll go back to the other field. He'll have this done in about an hour. It'll take us about a week to walk this field. He does come up with a good idea every now and then. Just a few minutes into the harvest, the machine encounters a target. It's not long until Steve gets a look at the machine's first find. Right there it is, actually. Wow! All right, so a meteorite this big is going to have that much metal in it. I'm sure 20% metal in it, probably. So if this thing would pick up a meteorite. <laughs> all right, all right, let's go. get back to work. The metal detecting harvester was a great idea, but after four hours of searching, all it finds are pieces of barbed wire, a couple of nails, and other meteor wrongs. Probably went another 100 feet and found another piece of metal, and then we found another piece of metal, and it was starting to get old pretty quick. 
But Jeff and Steve get an idea for another unconventional hunting approach. So Jeff's been jonesing for, <laughs> he, needs, he needs a rock. And there's a lot better chance that there's something small, more small ones. And so I have brought him back here just a little ways away from where I found my little one at the beginning. It was my idea to come to this spot. I know, but I got him here. He didn't know how to get here. And um, so we've got this really cool cornfield. It hasn't been searched. And it looks like some other ground here. So um, Jeff's going to get at it. And we just got word. Steve's going in the airplane. Hello. Hello. Are you my ride? Maybe. <laughs> I'm Steve. Steve, how you doing? Doing good. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Looking for volleyball, basketball, watermelon-sized rocks sitting okay. in some of these green pastures. Right now, we're over the line. There you go. Okay, can we get a little lower? From 500 feet, they fly down the middle of the stream field. And in only minutes, Steve zeroes in on several foreign looking objects. Yeah, there, there looks like there's a couple something there. There was something there that. And right there, too. Yeah. Steve's just spotted what might be the big payoff to his high-flying search. OK, bye. So Steve just called. They just landed from their scouting trip in the airplane. And he said that they saw a, a dark spot on the ground very close to where we were hunting earlier at the large end of the strewn field. He's going to go check that out. I like it here. We're for sure in the line of flight. From the, from the fireball. And we have super nice light ground, has not been plowed. If they're black rocks here, they should be lying right on top of this straw. It's nice and light, it's dry, it's hard. It looks good. Let's just hope there's some rocks here. Once the flight's over, Steve hits the ground running anxious to get a closer look at what he saw from a few hundred feet up. So this airplane trip was amazing. Got to cover quite a bit of land, crisscrossed over the, the bulk of where the big zone is. I'm going to go check this black spot out that I saw in that field. Hopefully, the landowners are there. And they'll let me get down there, and we'll find out what that was. Gotta be kidding! What Steve saw from the plane was a meteor wrong, courtesy of Mother Nature. I guess from 500 feet up, this is what a green looks like. Oh, well. I'm always a bit skeptical about what we call fireball chases, and this is a fireball chase. A meteor event is witnessed in the sky. Meteorites are reported to be on the ground. We rush out there as quickly as we can, try and recover some of them. Reports of meteorite falls are often exaggerated, and people go, oh my god, there are hundreds on the ground, maybe thousands, they're all over the place. And you get there, and you find out that only a handful have, have been discovered. And that is what usually happens. Just a little over a year ago, I was in Canada, and in two days, my small team recovered over 100 freshly fallen stones. And so when it's good, it's really good. But that kind of thing only happens maybe once in a decade. So I try and be practical when I come out on these things. I don't really like fireball chases. I would much rather go to a strewn field that we had discovered or that we have worked in before and spend our time mapping it, hunting it methodically. This is um, it's pretty nerve wracking. We knew the odds of finding meteorites here are pretty poor. Not much material's fallen, and so we thought we'd try and use everything at our disposal. Upshot of all of this, scouting truck, quarter of a million dollar metal detector tractor, nothing. All the pieces we found, by eye, with a magnet stick. I don't know how we can still not find stuff, even with that enormous device out there working for us. There's just nothing here, I guess. 
That fireball was so bright that it indicates nearly everything burned up in flight, and very, very few pieces made it to the ground. That's why we're having such a hard time. Well, we've got a few hours of daylight left. I'm going to go back to the old school. Normally, it's really slim pickings early, and you start to learn where the meteorites are not. You're putting this piece of the puzzle together one at a time. Brad, got one. The irony here is right off the bat, I found one. And then the next day, really early in, found another big one. Yes! Yeah, baby! And you get the hopes up that it might get a little bit easier. We can only do what we can do. There is only one thing left to do, split up again to cover as much of the nearly 24 square mile strewn field as possible. Steve is off to location number seven, a nearby farm whose owner has granted him permission to hunt. He also recruits some additional help, the farm owner's granddaughters, Emma, Taylor, and Olivia. What we're gonna do is make you some magnet sticks, okay girls? It's a little bit luck. But it's a little bit skill, too. And I'll show you a meteorite and see how it picks it up. I like cornfields. You know why? Because there's rows, and we can line up in rows, and we can walk, and then you know what you've covered and what you haven't. It. It's called gridding, OK? So let's go line up in a lane and make this happen. <laughs> let's go. That's right. We're burning daylight, as they say. It's kind of hard to find meteorites in the dark. I think my chances have quadrupled now with this team. It's best if you see anything that's even questionable, just stick your magnet on it. Steve and his hunting apprentices put it into high gear, covering the cornfield several rows at a time. Look what's in my row! <laughs> that's a real one! Oh my goodness. <laughs> Look at that. So this thing, like three days ago, was out in outer space. Steve's find is their biggest space rock yet, 175 grams, worth about $12,000. He's anxious to track down Jeff to show him the find. Hey! Hi, what's up? Any luck? Just some cow droppings. How about you? Funny you should ask. Seriously? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I was over there with this farmer, and his uh, granddaughters were out there with me. We were gridding this cornfield, and uh, just sitting right there waiting for us. This has to be one of the largest ones, or possibly the largest one found here. Well, I'll wrap up here. You want to meet back at the truck? OK. All That's right. good. Well done. Thank you. That makes it all worthwhile. Just that. The guys walk away from this hunt with three rare and valuable finds. They still have a few unanswered questions about the striking similarities between the 2003 Park Forest meteorite and their Wisconsin finds. They ship a sample to NASA's Dr. Zelensky for further analysis and head to Texas for the results. Every time there's a fireball like the one that plunged into southern Wisconsin, it's given a name based on the location of the strewn field. It's also assigned a scientific category based on its specific mineral contents. Scientists classified the 2010 fall as an L5-6 chondrite, L meaning low iron. That's the same classification as the Park Forest meteorite of 2003. So what are the odds that these two fireballs originated from the same asteroid? As for the official name, scientists chose Mifflin, the name of the town where at least two meteorites were found after the April 14, 2010 event. We're here in Houston, here at the Johnson Space Center with Dr. Mike Zelensky. He's a meteorite specialist. And what better place than 
the headquarters of the American space program to study things that have fallen on the surface of our planet from outer space. One of the things that we were kind of wondering about was the similarity between this rock and the appearance of the rock that fell in Park Forest, Chicago in 2003. Well, good seeing you again. <laughs> so, so you've been taking a look at uh, our Mifflin, Wisconsin meteorite. Right, it's a lot like Park Forest. So here's a section of Park Forest meteorite. So one of the really interesting things that's come up about Mifflin the meteorites produced by the Great Wisconsin Fireball is that the structure really looks similar to Park Forest. There's that brecciation. Right, we so they different... look the same. So they could have come from the same parent asteroid. That's so one thing we don't know is, are all the L chondrites, are they all from the same asteroid? Or are there several different L chondrite asteroids? And that we don't know. The L chondrites probably all come from a small number of asteroids. Not every asteroid sends rocks to the Earth. They have to be in special positions to dynamically be possible to send rocks to the Earth. And only a small number of asteroids are like that. Mike was able to do some side-by-side -side comparisons, uh, visual comparisons, and pointed out that, yes, some of the same factors were, were at play in both parent bodies, and that maybe these did come from the same parent body. Didn't know it conclusively, but it was pretty, pretty interesting. The real little meteorite that I found, I ended up selling for right at $100 a gram. So a three grammer at about $300. The other pieces and slices were selling from 60 to 120, $130 a gram. Yeah, baby! In the world of meteorite collectors, $100 per gram, nearly double the price of gold, is a premium price. The final values also have a lot to do with the rule of supply and demand. If the Wisconsin Fireball had produced hundreds of pounds of meteorites, the value would have been much lower. But the massive fireball above Mifflin, Wisconsin, has only yielded about eight pounds of meteorites so far. Look at that. The combined weight of all three finds is 220 grams, with an approximate value of $16,000, a very good week. On one hand, we're fortunate that we found anything, but on the other hand, it'd be nice if we found something really huge and we can get a big premium on something huge. But at least the little bit we found, we're getting a little bit more per gram out of it. The Wisconsin Fireball that we chased so hard, worked so hard to find pieces from, has now become a part of history. It's officially been named, it's officially been classified, and so, this long and rather strange adventure has finally come to an end here at NASA. It's been really a great way to close it.